The topic here is uh, the Bible is a children's book. I feel uniquely qualified in one sense and uniquely disqualified in another sense to talk about this because I was one of those guys that went to, to seminary and got my seminary degree and did the professional ministry thing and spent a lot of time getting paid to be right about what the Bible says and uh, can say at this point from having that experience that it was a, it was a trap, especially, you know, specifically for me it was, a, it was a trap and taught me a lot of bad things about how to approach the scriptures and about how to um, interact with the people of God and how myself even to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, I wasn't a child, in fact. I couldn't be a child. I had to be correct and an expert. And uh, those two things are not compatible when it comes to uh, being a part of the body of Christ and a functional part of the body of Christ. So I'm qualified to say I believe that uh, like everything else that we do, uh, we, it's profitless. The academy, going to seminary, all of these things are, are profitless uh, at the end of the day. Um, that's probably a provocative statement in some context, maybe not this one. Um, so let's talk a little bit about becoming children and why it's important to look at the scriptures uh, as a children's book, because I really do believe that the Bible is a children's book. It is written for children. It is not written for adults. And if you're an adult and you come to the scriptures as an adult, you will necessarily come to the wrong answer. You will distort, twist, break, and eventually be broken by the scriptures, because God is faithful. He will, he will always break us. So, well, let's see, Luke, by the way, 45 minutes, is that what I have, Dan? I got to... Well, don't say that on this stuff. It's funny, I was, I had to go home sick from work this week, which is unusual for me, and uh, I missed a meeting, and one of the folks at the meeting said, wow, this meeting got done an hour earlier, because Carl wasn't here. Ah, uh, not from this person. <laughs> So I'm going to set my little gadget here for 45. Whoa. I can't put my glasses on with the gadget around my head. Let's see. There we go. Uh, I think it's like Luke. Is it 18? Does it talk about children? Yeah. Uh, Luke 18. Let's do 15 in a few verses. It says, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. It's pretty straightforward. To such belongs the kingdom. So, I think, not to completely totalize here, but I think that in order for us to know the Lord and to be known by the Lord, um, we have to become like children. And in order for us to know the Lord and to be known by the Lord, uh, we have to be approached with and receive the truth that comes from the scriptures. So therefore, I, I conclude that it's possible that the, the scriptures are really a children's book. Um, let's go right back to the beginning for a second. Genesis 1. In the beginning... In the beginning. In the Genesis, yes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Cool. Let's go to John, chapter 1. I love jumping around in the scriptures. I'm setting up some bookmarks. Have you guys noticed old stories like, um, like The Wizard of Oz? The, you watch the movie or you read the book and... Uh, actually, I've not read the books. So I probably shouldn't say for sure. But the, 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 the movie for sure sets out all the characters in like the first five minutes and it kind of puts them in a context. And after you've already seen the movie, you look back at the first five minutes and you realize, holy smokes, the, almost the entire story is like captured in the first five minutes and all the characters are, are introduced in their, in their uh, the part that they're going to play is, is pretty well foreshadowed. I think uh, It's a Wonderful Life is another movie like that. The scriptures... Uh, are similar in the sense that we have this, this in the beginning and then throughout you see repeated and rehearsed and developed 
the characters and the, the patterns that are introduced in the first, the first few chapters. But I just want to put a couple bookmarks for us to hang our story on. John says, in the beginning was the Word. So we have two, two chapters, if you will, in this book we call the Bible that start out with in the beginning. And that's kind of a totalizing statement, in the beginning. We think about the stories that we read now, usually like once upon a time, children's stories, allow children to go separate where they are to, to some other place and begin to get their mind into what, you know, what the story is about to unfold. But this, this book that we have, this story that we're reading says, in the beginning, that does not allow for anything outside of that, I don't think. So what promise comes with a story that starts out with in the beginning is that this story is going to explain every other story that ever was and ever will be. It will explain why it is that we like stories. It will explain why it is that we behave the way that we behave. It will explain why we ask the question why. That's the promise I think that the scriptures give to us by starting out by saying in the beginning and then talking, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a little more time later on looking at what John says about in the beginning was the word. So, children, a book, a story, what else do you need for a good time? But as we're starting to think about how the Bible is a children's book, let's, let's stop for a, a small, brief moment and describe children for a second. I need someone to write because my handwriting is terrible. Uh, hey, hey, Gary. Adjectives describing children. Ready? Go. Anybody? Loud. What? Loud. Innocent. Loud. Loud. Truthful. Simple. Perpetual motion. Yeah, we should have given him how many we had to fit on here. He's, a, he's an engineer. He probably would have been able to figure out the font size and the kerning. Yeah. Animated. Animated. Imaginative. Creative. Trusting. That's a good one. Simple. Yeah, that's fantastic. Simple. Curious. Adventurous. Thank you, Kenny. Foolhardy. Joyful. Fearless. They, they do have a know-it-all attitude, right? They, they tend to, uh, at times, be know-it-all. Uninhibited. They also listen to one person, usually the, the parent. Or some, they listen to some authority, whether it be their parent or somebody they trust. Children align to some authority. They're trustful. They are trusting of some authority. That's absolutely the case. Yes, Julian. My daddy's stronger than yours, yes. Okay, this is great. This is fantastic. So, this is how children are. And how do they play? I'm not going to keep writing. Let's describe. We've got lots of parents in here. So how, how do children play? Where, they, are. they play hard. They mimic. They, they what? They mimic. They mimic. They imitate. Where do they get the, the, the material for imitation? Family. They, family? Mom and dad. Mom and dad? In fact, whatever they're exposed to, actually. I'm sure you guys have done this experiment when you're completely burnt out and you're like, oh, I just got to put on a movie because I can't, the kids are just crazy. And then you see how they behave <laughs> after watching a few hours of Walt Disney or something like this. And the difference between that and you give them a stick in a box and a story that you read to them last night, and they behave, they mimic, they imitate differently. It is a function of how they're ex what they're exposed to. And that is something that we actually control, for the most part, um, what our children are exposed to. So, how, do, how about, how do, they, how do they learn? How do children learn? Repetition? Repetition? Observation. Observation? 
School of Hard Knocks. What is that? They make mistakes. They make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Through the story. Through the story, in fact. Yes. What happens as you're? I mean, who's had the experience of actually reading to their children and then getting from start to finish all the way through? No. Not, not the same night. Yeah, not the same night. What happens when you're trying to read a child a story, especially a really good story, a story that actually has characters that change and there's development of narrative and there's foreshadowing and there's, what happens, you're, you're four or five sentences into it and there's something that goes, eh. they start asking questions. And what do you usually say to them? Just, let's just read this story. Let me just read, finish the story. Interesting. Interesting. I wonder if actually we should stop at each of those. I mean, how, how many parents have raised children to the point where they stop talking to you and you wish they were asking you questions? I wonder sometimes, uh, for myself even, when the kids are asking questions, I like, let me just get through the story because usually I want to go to bed or I want to do something. Those are the times where they're actually engaging you and, and teachable. This whole notion of questions is very interesting, too, because we're going to spend a little bit of time in Genesis 1 through, uh, 1 through 5, um, 1 through 4, I should say, talking about questions. So this is how children are. So let's be honest. In our experience of life, can we really behave that way and bring home the bacon? Is it possible? Make money. Put food on the table. Clean the house. It's not a trick question, actually. It's it's a it's a tough question. Clowns do. You might have to pick a particular vocation. What's, I, I kind of like. I guess I'm being. What's the question? Can we behave like we've just described? children behaving and inquiring and engaging. Can we do that all day long? 24 hours a day, 7 days a week? I don't think so. Are we supposed to? I don't know. There's some scriptures in there that say that we're supposed to grow up. Right? Stop, stop being children. And, okay, so is this the first place we've ever found the Bible says one thing, the Bible says another thing, and it seems like it's saying two different things? Does anybody else experience this when they read the Bible? Yes, Mike. Yes. Taking a step back to tell the young ones the story that's within a story when they're teachable because they are going to see us as different than them. They're going to see us acting in a way that's different than them. They're going to see us reinforcing at times how they're playing and how they're inquiring and they're going to other, at other times see us trying to constrain them and cause them to grow up. So let me ask a different question. Because I, I think we are supposed to grow up. I want to kind of set that aside for a second. We, we really are supposed to grow up. We're supposed to mature and be sober and, and do the things uh, that the scriptures commend to us so that we can take seriously the fact that, that there is an enemy out there and uh, um, we have to be watchful. But when it comes to the scriptures, can we, can we bring that attitude and that perspective to the scriptures and make progress? The answer, obviously, is no by the way I'm asking it, but do, are we convinced of that? Do we take the same approach when we sit down to read our Bibles? When we sit down to discuss the Scriptures amongst ourselves? When we get together, whether it's, whether it's in a, a group of folks who say, I want to get together and read the Scriptures and talk about it, whether it's on a Sunday morning, it doesn't really matter when it is, is, is this the approach that we have. This is the attitude that we come to the scriptures with most often. I don't know. It has not been most often the attitude that I've come to the scriptures with. And what I've, the consequence of that has been a, I've accumulated a ton of knowledge. A ton of knowledge. I've learned all kinds of things. You know, I could probably tell you how many nails were in the, the ark or something like that. But I probably at, at one point in my life couldn't tell you what the ark meant and why it was important. Um, because what does knowledge lead to? 
leads to pride. What does love lead to? Edification, the glory of God, the kingdom. True knowledge, true knowledge. It's another thing we're going to spend a little bit of time talking, talking about as well. So I, I really believe that if, if you're going to come to this book and not be broken by it and not distort it, you actually have to purpose in your mind to, to change the way that you're thinking. Ask for the Lord to do something that's probably pretty significant when you've had a hard day of work uh, or you've had a difficult week or you've got a struggle with this or that so that we might have some of these characteristics when we approach the scriptures. We did an experiment a couple weeks ago. Not really an experiment. We, we were in our Sunday morning gathering and we opened up the book of Ephesians and we said to the kids, just listen as we read and I want you, anybody who has a question about anything, just to raise your hand and ask the question. And what was fascinating about that is they stopped at every word they didn't understand and it was really interesting to listen to us try to explain to children what these words were. What did they really mean? To try to communicate to them in a way that was meaningful. And it showed me that we have such a deficit in our understanding. I'll use this, this analogy. You know, son says to a father, how far away is the son? And the first answer is a very, very, very long way away. Very long way away. Yeah, but how far? Kids wanting to know more, wants to understand with more precision, with more accuracy. So it's, it's however many million, zillion miles, whatever, I don't know what the number is, somebody could probably Google it quicker. It's this many million miles away. And the kid says, well, how, ma how many is that? Could you give me an example of like, how many that is? I mean, really, you've had experiences of large numbers before you go to a, like a stadium and you see 100,000 people, it's, it's overwhelming, like, holy smokes. It's, 100,000 people. How do I explain to a child a million? How do we understand anything about a million? It's just, we have to create these, these uh, numbers to put this concept in our mind. Well, that doesn't work. So how far, like, it's not a million, I don't get that, Dad. Could you explain to me a different way? It's eight minutes, eight minutes. It takes eight minutes for light to go from the sun <laughs> to the earth. The kid's just lost, right? Like, I don't know, Dad, I turn the light switch on and it's like there automatically. So he goes back to it's it's really, really a long, long way away. Well, Dad, that's that's a better answer. That's that's a really good answer. I feel like sometimes when we go to the scriptures and you look at some of these words that really mean some really significant things, and you try to explain to them what what does this mean to a child, you, you start to sound like a mil ah, it's a million miles, it's eight light minutes, and righteousness means this and and uh, propitiation means this. And these are important words. I don't want to downplay these words at all. But I would submit to us, if, if we can't explain to children what they mean in terms that they can accept, I would say we don't understand. We have not yet understood as we ought to understand these things. So that's my exhortation, which is usually backwards, right? When you have these speaking events, you do the exhortation at the end. and Let us become like children and... Let's take a look at some things that are interesting. Look at the Proverbs. Proverbs is what kind of a book? Or wisdom. And what is it that we're supposed to gain as we grow up into Christ? Wisdom. How many kinds of wisdom are there? Two. The wisdom that comes from above that leads to all those things that we really are looking forward to and then the wisdom that comes from below. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell which is which. But look at how this book works. I'm going to catch us here. So, um, hmm. Hear, my son, verse 8. Let's see, where else does it say? So it keeps talking about all this stuff. Chapter 2, my son, if you receive. Some, some translations have my child, right? I think that's a... Chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 2. Chapter 3. How many of these chapters, how many of these sections are addressed to a child? 
it's absolutely fantastic. Like you read pretty much the whole book with the exception of a couple places towards the end. And it's, the book is addressed from a parent to a child, in this case, father to a son. Okay, how many of us have read the Proverbs and said, man, I really need to mention that proverb to so-and-so. That so-and-so really needs to know about that proverb. What has happened? You have taken the position of the parent, and you have placed the other in the position of the child. How many of us have actually taken that notion of reading the Proverbs and I'm really going to edify the person, I'm going to come up from that, that proverb, I'm going to give it to them. And they didn't want it. And the violence they felt is you putting them in the place of child and you in the place of parent. Why? Because you came to the scripture like a parent. This, this book is not written for parents. It's written for children. The Proverbs only work in your life if you are a child. It's addressed to children. You cannot read it in any other way without doing violence to it. You'll miss the point. You'll use it the wrong way. It'll bear bad, bad fruit. It will give forth the fruit of a wisdom that comes from below. There's my proof text. Now let's become like children for the rest of uh, our 26 minutes. God says in the beginning He created the heavens and the earth. It's amazing. You cannot truly go beyond that one verse as a child without doing something other than studying the Bible. How many of us have actually sat there and had somebody say, well, you know, however many questions you can ask about how, you know, is the world a bazillion years old? Is the world a thousand years old? And, and as soon as those kind of questions come, do you, do you stay in the text or do you end up leaving the text? You get to this place where Cain has a, has a wife and they have children and you ask the question, somebody asked the question, where did Cain get his wife? And how quickly you're away from the text and you're off into some other discussion. We're best suited to close our Bibles when, when those kind of questions come up. Because we're not, we're not children anymore. We're getting objective about the text. When you, when you open up your storybook with your children, have we had the experience where they start doubting the veracity of the, or the, the possibility of these things happening? I mean, really, when you're, when, when you're loving in your, into your children's life and you, you're explaining some crazy, fantastic story that could never happen, do they ever stop you and say, that's not possible? That can't happen. Pretty infrequently, I would say. And usually, if they are doing that, they're probably upset with you. Right? <laughs> they don't want you to read a story because there's something broken in your relationship with, with your children. Let's skip ahead a little bit. And let's talk about chapter 3. Again, I've said earlier, the first four chapters, I really think, lay out the framework for how the rest of the story is going to go. In, in some senses, the entire story is told within the first four chapters. Um, at least it's alluded to in the first four chapters. All the pieces are there. The scarecrow has been inter introduced. The tin man has been introduced. All these, these different dramas have been set in motion. And there's also buried in here the fundamental problem that we have as, as humans and why this story is actually interesting to us as children. So let's talk about that just for a little bit. I'm just going to read and talk through chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You, sh you will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The God, God said, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed, above, uh, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you, you shall eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. You shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, you shall, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and clothe them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I think, more or less, in one chapter, is the entire story of man. Not fully fleshed out, obviously, because the enfleshment of the story comes with the enfleshment of the Son of God. But it's all there, all the pieces. A couple things, because the, the charge of, of this discussion was to kind of set the theological stage for the kingdom of God and the church and the body of Christ and how it is that we're supposed to meet. There's many, many questions and many provocative thoughts I think that are going to come from this weekend. But a couple things that I thought were important to, to point out about how it is that we must approach our relationship to one another through Jesus Christ and with the Scriptures as the, the revelation of Him, uh, the written revelation of Him to us. Uh, it's, a, it's an exercise in deciding what not to say, but if I had to pick a couple things out of this chapter uh, to speak about very specifically. I'll ask a question, just because I know ugh, I love to ask questions. I hate standing up here and just talking. What was immoral about what Adam did? Was there anything immoral in the way that we understand morality. Why is that important? Why, why, why would it be important that Adam didn't do something immoral to bring death into the world? Really, I mean, if it, the, where do we see our struggle in most cases? It's, it, it sometimes is in the area of, of morality. But keep going with that thought. Finish, finish the thought, Chris. Okay. Yes, Bill. It would have set the basis of life and death on the law. That's interesting. The law that you're speaking about is the Ten Commandments law, right? Like the breaking the moral law as opposed to setting life and death terms framed in a relationship. You had something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a choice that was made about, Kenny had pointed out earlier, what do children do? What, 
they, they usually align with an authority. Have you ever been in a situation where some other, somebody else's kid is not acting the way they're supposed to and you give them a moral injunction that comes with the authority of the entire creation? Stop pummeling so-and-so and they're not your kid. What happens? They don't listen to you. Why not? Because they're not your kid. It's important that we understand this notion of obedience and disobedience and morality in terms of relationship. If I take this at face value as a child and I forget all the stories that I've heard and I forget all the songs that I've sung, who had the strongest relationship or who was the voice that was listened to by Adam and Eve? From the beginning, no other pieces of the story. It was the enemy, right? There's no other way to look at it. A child would not parse it any other way. If I was to ask a kid, whose daddy was Adam's? And you just read the story. You didn't have all the other stuff that, that comes along with traditional religious instruction. I bet you the kid would say, the serpent, because he listened to the serpent. He did what the serpent said. It's kind of interesting. So it's important for us to recognize theologically, talking about theology here for just a second, that this notion of relationship is important. It's quintessential in how we are to understand our relationship to God, our relationship to the image bearers. If we divorce our understanding of who God is from this notion of relationship, from this notion of listening and obeying, we are completely on the wrong track. You cannot know God objectively. You must know God in a relationship. You can know about many, many things without knowing the thing itself. The analogy we've used in, in the past is, which person knows better the kitty cat? The one who pets it and feeds it and, and cleans up after it and brushes the fur and, and takes care of it when it's sick? Or the one who gives it a little bit of ether, puts it on a table and turns it inside out with a scalpel and pins? There's, one, there's knowledge, right? Like One knows the cat in one way, the other one knows the cat in, a, in another way. And What kind of knowledge can we have about the Lord? I think it's only the kind that is intimate and relational. I don't believe there's any way for us to objectively know anything about the Lord in the let's vivisect or dissect. Or, it's not possible. In fact, what we see in the Scriptures over and over and over, people who claim to have that kind of knowledge of God end up with what kind of outcome? Balaam. Nope. Our knowledge has to be in the context of relationship. It's also important to see here that contrary to probably many things that we've been taught, there was no relationship between God and Adam and Eve before sin had entered into the world. That's a provocative statement. Some would say, wait a second. He was walking with him, talking with him. He, he gave him a commandment. And again, I, and I'll use the President of the United States for, for a moment. The President talks to us over the TV lots and lots and lots. He says many things to us. And we might think we know the President. We don't know the President. He doesn't know us. We hear the words that he says to us. We see a person through zeros and ones. But do we have a relationship with the President? Not one that I understand. There's no dialogue. There's no back and forth between me and Mr. Obama. So therefore, I'm not uniquely in a position to say much about him or him about me at the end of the day. And I look at this situation. God says to Adam, don't do this. Does that constitute a relationship? In any other way than, you know, the president saying... We're going to go do this, or I'm going to raise your taxes, or I'm going to lower your taxes, or I'm going to do... No, I don't think it's information. It's interesting. It's not a relationship that we can understand, that we can relate to. It's very abstract. 
But as soon as God starts asking questions, well then all of a sudden there's a relationship. And when do, when do the questions come? When do we see the questions coming? Only after sin enters into the world. What does that mean? Is God... Put yourself in the, in the, in the role of a child here. What, what does the child say? What is the text as the story is being told? God says, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. They eat. God comes asking questions. And then he says a bunch of things and puts some animal skins on them. What's the question that a child would ask in the face of, God says you're going to die when you do this. Why didn't they die? That's the obvious question. Okay, what's the answer? What are the possible answers? Well, God changed his mind. They did die. Different kinds of death. Interesting. Well, which is it? The kid's asking. I'm the child. You're the parent. Explain it to me. What happened? Did God change his mind? No. Okay. Did they really die? They did really die. What, what does it mean then? Because I've seen the chicken keel over. I've seen the cow step on the chicken and the chicken dies. And we, I've seen, I have this access to death that's childlike. Maybe I've seen a parent or a relative or, or somebody I know, the neighbor down the street in a, in a coffin that goes into a ground. But what does it mean? then if, if this, this notion of death is not what I think it is. He, he cut them off from the tree of life so they couldn't live forever. Oh, okay. What's that? Separation. separation. Well, I don't know. Is it, is it separation, though? Because it seems like what, what that caused is God to come running. In the face of transgression, God comes into the scene and starts getting intimate. <sighs> like a father who disciplines their child when they committed a wrong, they're separated from that father. So there's a separation in that sense, an emotional separation. So there is a separation that has something to do with this tree of life and there is this discipline and there is this stuff that's going to happen that's going to make their life really, really hard. But the establishment of the intimacy is there as well, isn't it? So there's drama right there in the beginning of the story that's unresolved. There's this separation. You can't live here. You're not going to live here and you're not going to be able to eat from that tree. I have no idea what that means. You keep reading and you find out, well, what, what is the tree of life, Daddy? What is the tree of life? You have to keep reading to find out what the tree of life is. And you get to the end and you still don't get a full picture of the tree of life, but you have something else that you can hold on to, which is a definition of eternal life in terms of what? John 17, 16 or something like that. That is it. Yes, that's eternal life. Eternal life is not living forever unless you define what living is. Living is knowing the Father and Jesus Christ whom He sent. That's it. That's what life, eternal life is. Okay, so I don't need to worry about the tree of life so much right now because I got at least that part of it down. The tree of life part is the, the, the next chapter or the next book in the trilogy. It's there. There's some things that are written about it, but I would submit to you we know very, very little I was afraid because I was naked. This notion of death as separation, the consequence ultimately was separation, but it was also the thing that engendered the intimacy. How is it possible that God would be able to engage His relationship with that which He had already condemned to death? Interesting question. The answer is given in this notion of the seed. Right? There's this promise that comes forth. God speaking to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So God has said, you do this, death is the consequence. And he talks about the woman's offspring. 
wait a second, they're dead. But she's going to give birth. Isn't giving birth life? What's going on here? Adam, without seeing this, without actually witnessing it come to pass, believes and says to his wife, your name is now Eve. Because God said to the serpent while I was listening that you're going to be the mother of all the living. Interesting. So the notion of faith is already there in Genesis, right in the beginning. The last thing I want to point out just from this chapter is again this, this notion of knowledge. I want to dissect a little bit. It says in verse 8, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? I would submit that this is the first engagement. This is the first evidence of relationship. And it starts with a question. Questions. Interesting. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? This is the most important question to ask yourself as a child. Whenever you find yourself in distress, at odds, and you come to an analysis of what the problem is, you should ask yourself, who told you that? Who was the authority that you listened to to come to that conclusion? If there's nothing else that we get from me nannering on 45 minutes, it's this question is the question if God is to be your Father and Jesus is to be your Lord that we need to always be asking ourselves as we approach our understanding or what we think we know about the real world. And what we think we know about the real world is what we bring to the Scriptures. We cannot avoid it, right? We bring what we think we know. Children are always interpreting their world in terms of what they know. Always. It's fantastic to listen to them do that because sometimes it's quite comical. I have to imagine that the Lord looks down at us and laughs as He sees us try to make sense out of our world with what we think we know because most of what we know is wrong. But in the face of a trial... <laughs> in the face of a calamity, in the face of where we have come up with a solution and the solution is, is creating havoc and misery and destruction or doubt or, or discouragement or whatever the negative thing is that's coming forth from the way that we're thinking, we have to ask ourselves this question, who told you that? And in this case, look at the analysis. Adam says, in response to the question, where are you? I heard the sound of you in the garden. Fact. I was afraid. Fact. Because I was naked. Interpretation of the facts. Root cause analysis. Problem is, he was naked ten minutes before he had this conversation with the Lord. Difference was, he wasn't ashamed then. So, is there fear that comes along with you? Of course there is. To say, in answer to the Lord, where are you? I was afraid because I was naked, and that's why I hid myself. Did he hide himself because he was afraid? Yeah, I think so. Was he afraid because he was naked? No. And this is the question. Who told you? Who told you that you were naked? Who told him that? He figured it out for himself. And this is our problem. Think about our children for a second. <laughs> when they get themselves in a jam and you start asking them questions, <laughs> how quickly do you get back to this? You did. I thought, I thought, I thought, it's fantastic. I mean, really, try this out sometime on your child. It's <laughs> they're, in a, they're in a pickle. They've done something completely crazy and disastrous and and you start asking them the questions and they get to this place where they thought and they thought wrong. How often in those conversations do we say, yes, yes, you thought, but is the problem not that you did this thing that I told you not to do? It's a, I mean, this is amazing, right? Just all you have to do is have some kids or be around some kids. You don't even have to have your own kids. And you watched this pattern work itself out. 
So the problem. Yeah. They do keep aligning themselves to different authorities. And where, where do we see, and I already pointed it out, where do we see Adam aligning himself to the authority of the Lord? It's not by what he does, because what he did was exactly what God told him not to do. It's by what he believed. And it was what was said not even to him, but it was said to the serpent. Interesting. Interesting. He believed when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So God is speaking in the future tense to the enemy about what's going to happen between the seed of the woman and the serpent. It hasn't happened yet. It's off in the future. It's a promise of sorts. Not so much promise as much as God saying, this is what is... This is what will be. Adam listens to this and says, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was to be the mother of all living. So his action was not commanded. Right? What he did as a consequence of what he heard and believed was not something that was commanded. It was not a law. It was faith. Interesting. Here it is. And I think what we need to do is just go back, maybe help ourselves a little bit, try to read these stories to the kids and see what they understand and what they don't understand. And what they don't understand, if we can explain it to them, I, I will guarantee in the face of a child's questions, you will learn more about the Lord than from all your private Bible study with a concordance next to you. All right. I'm actually going to try to keep my time commitment and shut up. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I want to challenge the thought a little bit because I think you're right that it, it does require all those pieces that you're hanging on top of in the face of a rupture of a relationship. Let me ask the question a little bit differently because let's just hold this notion. Does it make a difference at all, one little bit, about how we live our life or read the Bible if the relationship between God and man did not start until after sin entered into the world? Does it matter one whit? Who says no? Why? No, that's true. We are post fall in need of redemption, Chris. It will color and it will shape the way that you... And that's, that's important. I, I can't say exactly how in all circumstances it will shape the way that we read the rest of the story. Bill. But I think it will. This is in huge. And I'm sure you're going to develop this in hope in your Kingdom of God discussion. Oh, come on. I just planted a seed for you because there's not enough time to fully develop this. I think what Bill is saying is absolutely the case. Is what's happening to us, are we getting 
restored back to this state of innocence where we were with God in the garden, walking with Him and talking with Him, is that Jesus had to come to fix things and get them back to the way that they used to be. Let me ask a very pragmatic question. By reading what you saw here, with all the text and all the words that were spilled on how great that relationship was between God and, and Adam, is it compelling for us to go back to that? Or do we have to invent what that meant in our minds? We have to ask ourselves, who told us that? Where is that imagination coming from? Mike? I just think it's not about fixing the, the lifestyle. It's about fixing the relationship. It's about fixing the relationship and the consequences of the relationship, and it's always at God's initiative, and what's coming next is better. Is God in heaven, in this scene, rubbing His hands together saying, oh boy, what am I going to do now? They've disobeyed me. Everything's broken. Now I have to... Oh, I know what I'll do. Coming up with a plan B... Is there ever such a thing as a plan B for a God who speaks things into existence? I hope you believe no, because I think the consequences of believing yes are that you have a God who is not in control. It is, yes, Sam. Yeah. There's nothing in the scriptures that leads us. There's nothing in the scriptures that leads us to think that we are trying to restore a relationship before the fall. You couldn't hear what Sam was saying. I think so. Sam was kind of affirming the fact that when he's talking with his children about this very passage, they're not asking questions about what was God doing with Adam before this happened. Why? Because they're, they're, there's nothing written about that. It's not part of the story. And the part of the story that is prominent is in the face of transgression in the face of dialogue, in the face of exchange of information, this is what happens between the characters that have all been set into motion. Okay, so the, the Chris's question, just for people who couldn't hear, is, so what? <laughs> I love the so what question. What difference is, I mean, this, we're, we're kind of getting there, but Chris is driving it home. Why, why does it make a difference, this answer to the question, whether or not there was or wasn't relationship? I, I put it out there, not as a proof text, but to, to consider if the relationship that happens between Adam and Eve and the Lord is after the transgression, then Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. His relationship was always going to be, his relationship with his creation was always going to be contingent upon the Son of God taking on flesh, dying, being resurrected. And therefore, this book is about Jesus from cover to cover. From cover to cover. That means the Old Testament is not about how to live a moral life and what to do and what not to do. It's, it's not about that. It's about Jesus. And if, again, we can't understand from the beginning God framing His own story, us being born along through that story like a child, how it is that these things are about Jesus, then we just don't know yet. And our answer should be we just don't know. Rather than coming up with something and making it up on the spot.
So, so, so very practically, and I know, Chris, you're going to talk, I hope, about some of the ethics that come out of everything that you've heard from, you know, so Chris, you got the wrap-up session, right, on Sunday? You're gonna, are you going to talk about, like, the, the pragmatic? In light of everything you've heard all weekend, here's some very practical things you should be considering. Is that what you're going to do? I don't want to steal your thunder. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling a story. Ah, Okay. So practically speaking, when somebody comes into the assembly and says, well, I think the Bible says blah, 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 and everybody's like, that doesn't line up with our confession. What happens when you pull out your, your confession or you pull out your doctrinal statement or you pull out your concordance or you pull out my XYZ seminary professor? What happens? It's It's awful. You, you just have you're just trading authorities. You have two people who aren't even in the room arguing with each other. And what's the question that is given to us? Who told you that? Show us who told you that. Bring us back to something here so that we can see it and understand it. Just because it's new, just because we haven't heard it before, does that mean that it's necessarily wrong? I don't know. Show me who told you that. God makes this incredible promise that says we don't need teachers. Or statement, I should say. It's not a promise. Statement of fact in, the, in 1 John. We don't need teachers. We don't. Why? Because we all who have come to know and trust the Lord have within us the capability as children to approach the Scriptures as children and to hear His voice. And what confidence we have in, in, the, in the assembly is that we have that agreement. We have the ability to ask the question, who told you that, practically? Listen and say amen or continue asking questions. What happens when somebody comes and in, in, in there's division and it's doctrinal division and they say, well, A, and somebody else well says, B. There's no questions at that point. There's no knowledge. There's no intimacy. There's no relationship. In fact, there's something that's broken. And practically speaking, when we see those two things happening as a church, through its various members, through its various giftings, we are to call it back to who told you that? Where does that come from? And can we agree about that and move forward? Whenever there's I'll go even further and say, whenever there's doctrinal disagreement that ends up creating strife between two people bearing the image of God, confessing to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, there is sin at work. There will be something that needs to be confronted. There will need to be repentance and covering. You can't avoid it. This reminds me of the last thing I wanted to say. Unless there's any other burning questions. Oh, okay. Romans um, chapter is it three? Ah, yeah. Verse 4. I won't go into why he's saying this, but this verse actually has a, a standalone ring to it. Romans 4 3 says, By no means, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. We are wrong. We are liars. He is right. And God says, Correct. Good answer. You are justified by those words. Again, coming to the Scriptures as children, not sitting in judgment over them, but being judged by them, being found to be deficient by them, we can be justified by saying, God is right and I'm wrong. I like it simple. Amen. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.